Okay, I think we're ready to continue. Uh, those of you who are here early will have heard me mention that I think that uh, analytics is just as important as game design. Um, A-B testing is very important. Data science will tell you whether it should be A or B, but still your game designers will, will tell you what that A and that B should be. I'm reminded of a famous quote or, or, or criticism that somebody once said, uh, attributed to Andrew Lang. He said, he uses statistics as a drunken man uses lampposts for support rather than illumination. Measuring things just for the sake of measuring things really isn't important. We need to measure things in order to be able to make decisions to make our products better. So with that in mind, Mark's going to tell us how we're going to stop being drunken men and make our products better. Thank you very much. I'll try my best. Um, thanks, Nick. Um, my name is Mark Robinson from Games Analytics. Um, it's, it's great to see the games industry really starting to embrace the power of um, analytics and big data. I think you know, the new generation of game design, online games, um, connected games, gives us such an opportunity to really develop intelligent relationships with players that you know, the games industry is probably better off than a lot of other sectors. Um, and, and, and this is an interesting opportunity. And it's also a challenge. So what I wanted to do in the presentation today is just talk through some real practical um, ways that we work with data and support our clients to really improve the experience that players have in games, in online games. Um, I, I've, I've got an admission actually at the start of this. I'm, I'm not a games industry guy through and through. Uh, for much of my life, I, I ran a marketing services company. We did customer analytics for banks and for uh, retailers and online businesses. And you know, as you know, banks and, and retailers have spent a lot of money um, trying to develop customer relationship management. And you know, depending on your bank and depending on your retailer, you may, may not feel that you're on the end of a particularly intelligent relationship. But that's possibly because the banks, the retailers, they don't actually know that much about you. you don't, they don't actually know too much about your motivations. And the interesting concept in, in the games industry is actually within the virtual world, we know a lot about player behaviors. We can discern a lot about player behaviors. We can use metrics as proxies. And we can really go a long way to getting inside the minds of the players and creating um, attractive, engaging relationships and experiences with the players in the game. And that's, that's the challenge and that's the opportunity. And you know, it's great to see that uh, the analytics is really coming into the, the center of how games are developed and, and managed and, um, and progressed. So you know, our mantra, if we have a mantra, is that the games industry has got a big opportunity to move towards player relationship management, to really understand the different motivations of players, the different segments that are in your game, recognizing that players are having different experiences and have different wants and needs. <laughs> And really to, to develop that and develop a proactive relationship with the players in your game. So I'll talk a little bit about how we do that. So metrics and analytics are important. Um, they tell you the health of your game. They tell you how many active players you've got, your retention rates, and your, um, and your monetization rates. But really, they, they tell you your problems more than they tell you your answers. You actually. Um, there's a hierarchy in analytics. And analytics can be you know, quite a confused term. It's quite a broad term. Um, but actually, what, what we do at Games Analytics, and think, think of it as a, as a journey, think of it as a roadmap, through from you know, the basic level at the bottom there, data collection. And everybody collects data. Um, most people collect too much data and are overwhelmed and, and you know, part of, part of um, the challenge is to get insight out of the data. Certainly most people now we see have got you know, very good game performance metrics. They know number of active players and retention rates and monetization rates. More people now, and you know, this is a growing thing in, in the games industry, are looking at player, player metrics. So reorientating the view of the game from game performance to understanding the different player behaviors in the game. Segmenting players and then looking at what the individual triggers are that result in players leaving the game, looking at where players have got potential to spend, and then ultimately developing in-game messaging, out-of-game messaging that's targeted to individual, individual players based on their behaviours, based on their wants and needs that's, that's driven from the data analytics. 
So, you know, it, it'd be interesting to, to, to take a hand count. I'm not going to do that now, but I, I would imagine that the majority of the industry is in between the sort of game performance and player metrics level, <laughs> and the ambition is for us all to work together to get up towards um, retention, monetization behaviors and triggers being well understood, and individual personalized messaging, creating strong relationships with your players, your customers effectively. So just, just an example, a very quick example. You know, game metrics are good. It's, it's okay to know that your average sessions per player is 1.2, but actually you know, peeling the onion and getting underneath that statistic, we want to know, okay, tell me a bit more about the guys that have just one session and don't come back. How long is their first session? What is their exit um, event? Have they got stuck in the tutorial? Have they been spending unwisely their grind currency? Have they just not got it? Is the game not for them? There are lots of different reasons why players leave games. There's probably six or 10 or 12 individual reasons um, and changes that you can make in games to improve retention rates. The one thing that we, we use a lot at Games Analytics, and this is an example of a player metric and not a game performance metric, is playing speed. So how quickly are our players moving through the events that we're collecting? Um, how quickly are they? Um, what is their appetite for the game? And you can see that you know, people with, a, with a, um, a slow playing speed, they're frustrated, they're, not, they're unsure, they're not, they're not getting it, the tutorial maybe hasn't been understood, they've not even read the tutorial. You know, this is a good early indication um, of uh, predicting um, an exit event. So we can alert this early in the system and start to intervene with messaging, gifting items, giving specific hints and tips. And then at the other end of the spectrum, there's players that are impatient. You know, they might be expert players. They're being forced through a tutorial that they don't really need. And this is where you start to see that different players have different wants and needs, and we need to orientate the gameplay around that. So having a nursery section for the frustrated players having a fast track for the impatient players. You know, this is being responsive to the different levels of competency and expertise, and this will ultimately keep the players in the game for longer. So that's a, that's, you know, a good example of a player metric, and there are others that um, you know, we use to predict behaviors and to um, describe behaviors as well. So, um, one thing that we work a lot with um, our clients is to build analytics into the development cycle. I think it's, it's true to say that you know, analytics can be a bit of a bolt-on. You know, the, de the developers are really busy getting the bit game built to milestones. They really can't be bothered tagging the game. It's a pain. It distracts them from, from what you know, they want to be doing and what they're good at. And the, the way to solve that is actually to build analytics into the GDD and the design concept. It's, it's easy to tag games to collect the data. What's actually difficult is making sure that you've got all the data that you want at the particular time of the event to describe the player statuses and the player snapshots. So do you have XP available when you have a miss, mission complete? Um, do you have the different levels of grind currency and premium currency available? That's where the thinking needs to go in at the start of the game, the game development. So you are doing a good job of marshalling your data, collecting your data. So then the analytics can really unleash some powerful insights because of the rich data. Next step, once you've got your data flowing, is actually to step back and apply some really good free-to-play um, design best practices. You know, we've worked on over 50 games now. We've seen what works well in terms of monetization, what works well in terms of retention. And still, you know, we see a lot of games that are too harsh on monetization loops. They try and monetize players too early. Um, you need to be patient. Um, you need to engage players. And then, you know, there is a time to monetize. Um, and so it, it's quite um, advantageous to think of good, good principles at the start of the, of, of the development through beta seeing how the, the general game design is orientated and, to, and use beta very effectively on general game design stuff, 
but also to start to analyse player behaviours and start to think about um, segmenting players and responding to specific feedback. So you know, beta is a really important phase. You can sort out a lot of the issues using good practice design principles and starting to respond to player feedback. And, you know, and as the last speaker was saying, some of the stats here are pretty scary. If, you, if you're spending all of your acquisition budget and 70% of the players are not coming back, you've got to do something about that. Stop, stop acquiring them in the first place, but better is to give them a better experience so that you can improve those retention rates. Um, if 1% are paying, what about the other 99%? It's worth having them, but which ones have got potential? So we run a benchmark um, tool um, assessing um, game, games against best practice over 75 categories. And these are some of the sort of interesting stats that we've collected um, through, through doing the assessment, showing where game design is generally strong and free to play, or game design is, has got weaknesses that need to be addressed. And it's kind of surprising, the monetization is the, is the weakest performing area. Still, games are trying to monetize players too early before they're engaged, before they're you know, liking the game and have committed to the game. Um, game mechanics are really well balanced, uh, are better balanced in mobile, we see, than other platforms, which is interesting. Um, social games tend to have poorer retention, the mid-core and, and hard, hardcore, um, bringing new players into the game and giving them a good um, onboarding experience. Uh, the gambling mechanic, so there's a range of different mechanics that you can use. The gambling mechanic is, is the least used and actually one that builds strong engagement. Only 20% of games that we've analysed um, display any sort of gambling mechanic. Um, and you know, really, only th th this next one is an important one. Only 22% of games deliver a good first sec 60 seconds for novice players. So there's, there's lots to do in terms of general game design. And then we can move into understanding the different players. So we, we use this segmentation a lot as a, as a generic tool, and we can customise it for particular games. You see top, top right, the, the, the dark green circle. Those, those players have got high revenue potential. They've got high virality, so they're your potential whales, your, your potential dolphins, and those are the guys that you want to keep in the game, keep engaged. The guys in the top left, the purple circle, they haven't got much revenue potential, but they're highly sociable, so they're very influential of, of other players, so you want to keep them happy. You don't want to monetize them because they're not going to monetize, but you certainly want to keep them engaged. And then you start to worry about the two big circles in the middle, which are different types of retention issues. And you can start to see that you can develop um, behaviors and segmentations and start to think of messaging strategies because the messaging strategies will be entirely different for each of the different segments that we've displayed here. So. Um, We've built a technology that collects data from the game, it scores players into segments and treatment groups, it sends messages into the game, and then it, it measures the uplift. So this is a, vir a virtuous circle of testing and learning. Um, it personalises the, the, the um, experience for the players in terms of personalised levels of messaging. It's not just about general engagement and monetization. you can actually go a long way to talk about playing styles and to understand playing styles, whether players are aggressive, competitive, combative, collaborative, competent, incompetent. There's lots of different ways that you can cut it, and you can start to think about defining messaging strategies for each of those different styles of gameplay. Um, we start to um, think about how players um, discover games, they engage with games, they become advocates, they master the game and then they start to um, disengage. So all players move through the, this loop. It's at different speeds. Um, but there are strategies that you want to adopt at each part of, this, of the playing life cycle, from retaining and engaging at the start, to socialising, to monetising, and back to retaining at the end. And actually, in terms of individual messaging types, you can start to be quite sophisticated in, in the types of messaging. Um, welcome messaging and gifting resource to keep players engaged at the start. First payment bundles as you move through towards monetization and trying to move the, the dial from 1% paying to 1.5% paying. VIP strategies, 
responding to people that are browsing in the store but aren't buying, level passes for people that are um, impatient. There's lots of different levers that we can pull now to message the players at the right time with the right information and the right offer. So just to finish, um, pulling all of that together and um, talking about uh, a real example. This is a mobile racing game, um, initially launched on iOS and Android, um, launched in Australia and we used the beta phase to really optimise the general game design. But actually when we implemented the messaging, um, based on the behaviours that we saw in the game, we were able to dramatically improve retention and improve monetization. So um, example messages were to customize the car, decoration offers for people that liked customization, people that were being slow and finding the challenges quite difficult and having to repeat them a time, we could give them level passes once they'd failed a number of times. Fast tracking people with different energy discounts and, and upgrade discounts. Um, and being generous to frustrated people, gifting them energy, giving them more attempts within particular challenges. And also VIPs, rewarding VIPs for their commitment and, and their, their spending power. So a, a nice combination of messages that were delivered to individual players based on their playing style at an appropriate time in the game. Monetization, we see people will monetize in the first session off their own devices, but they will not respond well to monetization offers in the first session. We see that being much more appropriate session three, four, five, once players have actually um, understood the game, learnt the game and, and engaged with the game. So, you know, 38% uh, increase in revenues, retention was improved by 95%, so we can dramatically shift the, the numbers here by uh, deploying these sorts of techniques. So, um, that's it. We've got a big opportunity in the games industry to respond to what players are telling us. Um, it's a journey. There's lots of um, questions going to be answered as, as we get deeper into the data and the behaviours. But, you know, I, I firmly believe that this is the future and, and, and this is analytics and good game design, creative ideas, is where the games industry is going. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Mark? Well, maybe I can ask a question uh, related to uh, something I asked earlier. Your technology, does it only work when the user's physically connected online? If I'm using my tablet device and uh, playing a game on the plane on the way home to Seattle, are you going to cache all that information? And then when I reconnect again, rebroadcast out my frustrations or my paces? Or is the, do you have to be connected at that time? So we, we cache the data collection when you're online and so the, so the data can catch up the history. Um, the, the system is built so that we are never disruptive of the gameplay. So if you're not connected, we'll not attempt to send the message or even send the message when you're next connected. We will stop if we will um, suppress the message. We're very, we're very careful to have strong rules of engagement. So if we message you about something three times and you don't respond, we stop, we leave you alone because we, we take the hint. Um, we never message about multiple things, different things in, in the same session. So we're, we're very careful that the messaging is adding to the experience and is not um, disruptive of the, of the, the gameplay. And, and in terms of low-hanging fruit, since lots of developers here in the audience, if you could say there's one thing that you should really do from what we've learned, if you only do one thing and go home tomorrow and do it, what would that one thing be? I, I think approach the game. The, the, the biggest number that we can drive is by approaching the game with the mindset of a new player, with a novice player. Don't assume that the player knows anything, and then that will, you know, and give the players options at the start so that they can go down an expert channel or a novice channel, and that's the way that you're really going to unlock decent retention rates and, and move you know, the acquisition budget into a plane where it looks like it's worth spending all of that money. It's really being responsive as early as you can to the level of competency of the player. And that first 60, 60 seconds is absolutely vital. More questions? If you're very shy, I'm sure Mark will be here afterwards to answer any questions for you. Okay. Well, thank you, Mark. Thank you.